to create a platform for that and bring people together to discuss books and writing and issues. And surely you cultivate, you know, a, a growing sort of literary arena and interest. To understand philosophy is digging deep within ourselves by not just reading, but also writing. Um, it's a form of us to communicate, not just to other people, but to ourselves. Because we also struggle to understand ourselves. Inilah Endgame. Hai teman-teman, akhir-akhir ini kita cukup khawatir mengenai apa ya yang bisa disebut kurangnya masyarakat luas di seluruh dunia itu terkait dengan kepentingan untuk bisa lebih literate atau berliterasi. Literasi ini tidak bisa semata didefinisikan hanya untuk bisa membaca tapi juga memahami isu-isu yang penting. Kita hari ini kedatangan dua tamu yang kalau menurut saya sangat berperan untuk kepentingan pengedepanan literasi, budaya, baca buku yang menurut saya itu bulat sebagai antidote untuk budaya lain yang akhir-akhir ini semakin kental sekali. Bagaimana kita tuh terpojok, terjebak dengan sound bites yang pendek sekali. Hari ini kita kedatangan Lakshmi dan Janet Denif. Uh, Janet tentunya sangat terkenal dengan aktivitas Ubud Writers Festival yang sudah berjalan selama kurang lebih 20 tahun. Ini dalam misi untuk meningkatkan budaya baca, budaya baca dan menulis. Dan tentunya sangat diinginkan untuk kita lebih mengerti mengenai gimana kita bisa memperkaya budaya baca, budaya nulis, khususnya untuk kalangan anak-anak Indonesia dan orang Indonesia ke depan. Dalam percakapan ini, diskusi ini, kita akan ngobrol banyak mengenai isu-isu yang mungkin perlu terekspos dalam konteks literasi, terekspos dalam konteks diskusi dan diskursus. Ini isu-isu termasuk bagaimana penyikapan, penanganan mengenai perubahan iklim. Dan juga mengenai bagaimana anak-anak muda itu lebih harus memiliki kapasitas emotif, bukan hanya kognitif. Dan ini mungkin memerlukan kepekaan terhadap bagaimana kita bisa berfilsafat, bagaimana kita lebih memahami, membaca sastra. Dan juga isu lainnya ini termasuk bagaimana manusia itu bisa lebih sensible, bukan hanya sensitif. Sensibility itu agak beda dari sensitivity dan gimana kita tuh harus lebih memahami sejarah. Tapi juga yang lebih penting khususnya dalam konteks percakapan saya dengan mereka, arts history. Bagaimana sejarah mengenai seni di masa lalu itu penting untuk kita bisa lebih lebar wawasannya, lebih sensitif, lebih bisa menggunakan EQ dalam aktivitas kita sehari-hari. Saya rasa ini adalah gambaran mengenai apa yang kita bicarakan, diskusikan bersama Janet dan Laksmi. Selamat datang di Endgame. Semoga bisa dinikmati. Terima kasih. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is ours. <laughs> It's been a dream for us to come here. <laughs> It's a dream for us too. It's. Yeah. Uh, I know it, it. It took a while to make this work, but. Janet, what's what's up uh, in the upcoming Ubud Writers um, Festival? Yeah, well, actually, first we have the Ubud Food Festival. Yeah, it's ongoing, soon, right? Yeah. yeah, and then uh, we have the Ubud uh, Writers and Readers Festival in October, Dibiasa, and then uh, this year we celebrate 20 years, so it's our anniversary. My so gosh. it's a bit of a um, the, the writers or the food. The writers actually. Okay. So the food's Fantastic. just a baby compared to the writers' yeah. festival. How long has so. the food been around? Uh, well, I guess um, it's our sixth event this year, but you know, with the break with COVID for two years, so it's it's kind of like seven years, but um, or eight, I don't know. But okay. yeah, okay, yeah. And so. what what do you think might or will make this year different for the, in the past for both the food and the writers? Um, I guess the the food festival is just a really exciting program, and we have a lot of uh, little food tours around the island, so yeah. um, people can actually see what's happening behind the scenes, you know, and right. connect with artisan producers and 
you know, see, yeah, different foods, sea salt, palm sugar, chocolate, things like that. And just, um, I mean, it creates this whole Garden of Eden, doesn't it, with, with Bali, the fact that we just have everything. Uh, so we love to show our guests, you know, our visitors um, nice. how amazing Bali is. And then uh, we have a lot of great chefs appearing, both from Indonesia and this region, and, uh, yeah, lots of amazing food. So, um yeah, it's it's pretty fantastic. We all love it because food's such an enjoyable thing, you know. I mean, it's yeah. the greatest pleasure in life, really. One of them. So all anyway, the best. yeah. And and the writers, that's going to be in yeah. October, the writers right? is the twentieth anniversary, so yeah. that's October again. Uh, we're currently selecting writers and mapping out a program and trying to think about what we can do to make it really uh, exciting, more mm. festive. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of our homework right okay. now. Yeah, is is a succession in play on the Ubud Writers Festival? As in, you see Lakshmi as of course. somebody who's yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to tell her that. But by the way, <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah. nobody asked me, but it's okay. no, I, nobody asked me what I wanted to do, but it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be nice, yeah. wouldn't it? What do you think? One thing that I would do different uh, than my mom for the festival <laughs> is going more online, incorporating more, incorporating more technology, and just being more present in this, you know, platform in these platforms on social media and just online in general. Yeah, um, I think that yes, there's of course a threat to reading being. Hmm, extinct no i don't think it will ever be extinct to be honest we will always have to yeah. read it's a one form of communication that can never go away yeah um but yeah it's it's definitely shifting we have chat gpt now so yeah it's amazing we need to talk about reading amazing and writing and in general bad. yeah it's, it's what do you think mm. of chat gpt um as you say, amazing, good, amazing, bad. It's it's really scary, actually, mm. uh, because we've experimented um, writing things, you know, like somebody experimented with a story and it's like, damn, it's not bad. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't know how, how it's going to pan out, actually, because um, there, there's one guy, I think, on the internet who wrote like 10 books in one year with ChatGPT, like, and you could. So, you, could, you could write a book in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, that's the thing. We all talk about modern technology, but uh, are we sort of killing ourselves with these great innovations? Where does it go? Or yeah. Where does it end? You know. I've personally never tried Chat GPT. You should. But I feel like I'm very interested. When in I AI. talk about, I use it all the time. I do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Full disclosure. Oh my god! Um, no, I'm very interested in AI and technology, and I feel like mm, because we are always on our phones, we're always on so social media. Yeah. We, our phones has become our right hand, basically an extension of our bodies. We are also at the same time going back into spirituality to balance it out. We're we're also learning mm. about connecting with our emotions and going mm. deep within ourselves. So I feel like. Um, just staying optimistic about it is important. We're all here to trial it out together, yeah. but it's inevitable. It's part of our progress and we're going in that direction. So might as well just learn from it, um, take it in and see how we can just do our best to not for it to take over what we have as humans that makes us so special. I mean, I've I've been talking about it quite a lot, but how AI is not being discussed in a multidisciplinary manner. You you brought up the topic of spirituality, yes, right? And I think that needs to be infused in the discussions, preferably discourses, with regards to how AI could be utilized for better purposes of humanity. But, but I've, I've been critical in the sense that the technologists, they tend to just be very exclusive mm. without roping in people of culture, people of spirituality, people of mm. economics, people of sociology, people of other dimensions. And there is a risk that this thing gets forward 
in a very unjudicious manner because you need those dimensions, right? What do you think? So you feel like uh, with AI, it might divide us, divide us even more. Yeah, divide that's that's one more. possible consequence. And divide is okay if it's just left or right. Mm. But divide of its top and bottom. That's yes, a much more scary proposition, right? right? And and I've been saying quite a lot about how the internet has elitized society mm. to the point just the top 0.1% mm. would control disproportionately much larger percentage of the economy as compared to the remaining 99%. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, could further exacerbate the inequality that mm. we've all tasted in the last few decades. It I could guess, be corrected. <clears throat> I if, guess it mm. just goes to show that, you know, these days, uh, power means knowledge. Yeah. Intellectuality. Yeah. That's even a word. <laughs> yeah. In, um, yeah. Intellect. Yeah. Intellect. Yeah. That's where you can go in that 0. 0.00 whatever percent. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's the power these days. Yeah. I it's mean, not in, who's president. It, it's who has the brain. And in an ideal world, intellect needs to be democratized. Yes. So that everybody owns it. Everybody gets it. Everybody feels it. Everybody shows it. But intellect has not been democratized. Mm. It's been just in a few zip codes and a few heads, as opposed to all 8 billion heads of humanity. Now, how do we make sure that intellect actually occupies the heads and minds of all these 8 billion people? So, you wanna? Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Well, I mean, yeah. one means is reading. Exactly. Yeah, then? Education. Yeah, education. I mean, it's pretty systemic. Mm -hmm. In one way, the internet has opened it, it doors to everyone. To information. To information. But not ideas. Not ideas. Mm. And it also makes us all standard. We all share or have the same ideas because we consume from the same platform, the yeah. same sources. And that's where books comes in. Yeah. You know, we, we read about things from um, years back. We read from things that are written from like people from all across the world with different experiences, with different cultures and different ideas. And we all get to share and read about that. So I guess, yeah, that's why we need to go back into reading actual books and not just read um, from the internet. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Janet? Yeah, I agree, of course. Um, and I guess in order to get back to reading like that, um, there has to be some sort of movement, which probably has to be through social media or, you know, um, mm. using the platforms that people are familiar with. Um, to do, create. do you sense that what you've done for the last 20 years, at times, not all the time, that this would have been an exercise of futility? Or utility? Well, I mean, uh, I, I knew when we started the Writers Festival that uh, we were in a place where people didn't necessarily read a lot, but I figured yeah. that uh, the more you create a platform for that and bring people together to discuss books and writing and issues, um, surely you cultivate, you know, a, a growing sort of literary arena and um, yeah. interest in that, you know, you just create um, that kind of platform. And I think when you bring people together, it just sort of um, creates an excitement anyway that encourages people to read, you know, if it's all yeah. about reading. Um, I mean, it's, it's really cool what you're doing, right? But we're, we're talking about putting that in the context of this massive technological force mm -hmm. that makes people just shackle themselves into sound bites of... 30 seconds, three mm. minutes, or 140 characters, or 280 characters. <laughs> I mean, what you're doing is a great act of nobility, right? It's, it's good, but what do you think can be done to amplify or to be amplified in such a way that we can actually be the antidote to this 
massive technological force that forces or shackles people into this narrow corridor mm. Mm. of sound bites. Mm. Yes, I guess. Um, well, trying to focus on the young people. Um, you know, we have the emerging writers yes. as part of the program, yep. um, yep. trying to engage with them and get them more involved. We also have the satellite program after mm. the festival where we go to remote yep. areas around Indonesia trying to connect with um, like marginalised communities, in fact. So mm. um, just, yeah, trying to connect with people and create opportunities, I guess, through yep. writing um, and I think too we need to think more about awards for young writers and things I like agree. that. So, mm -hmm. I agree. Um, yeah, monetize those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is all new to us, right? We're only going through this now, so we really need to think of ways. And um, for the younger generations, actually, a lot of them are quitting social media. It's becoming a trend as well, just like getting out of it. Really? Yeah. Mm, that's new. It. Mm. Yeah. Getting completely out of social media? A lot of people are. I mean, a couple of years ago, there were the trends of like these phones that are made in somewhere in Scandinavia that doesn't are not smartphones. They're just phones okay. for calling. Okay. So getting well, out of that. I thought you were talking that, about here. No. The young here. Not or here. the young in Europe. Yes. Okay. Do you see that as a trend that's going to be trendy here? In the West. It could be. You know, I'm not, not saying no. Okay. But, yeah. okay, I, I, I feel that in order for this to be scalable, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's got to involve the big guys, right? The big guys being yes. either the government or somebody out mm -hmm. there that has stupid money to throw, yeah. yes. right? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll be very, you know, open about this. I mean... Would there be anybody or any people out there with stupid money <laughs> who perhaps would share, right, your mm -hmm. sentiments, our sentiments about the need to mm -hmm. get as many people as possible to yeah. read? And without being able to read properly, they're not going to be able to write mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. Right? What do you think? Ask me. Well, I feel like, I mean, we are homo sapiens, so we need a lot of stimulation from the outside world. And yeah. these people with a lot of money need to be able to stimulate the young children to be interested in reading from an, a very early age. And when they are stimulated from reading, they also open up doors for themselves to go into other things and not just like consume from one source and then we all become standard standardized yeah. um and then also to you know make them want to write i don't exactly know the answer or the solution or how you can spend this money to make people <laughs> want to read and write um but maybe popular culture can help celebrities influencers like you you know You're they, a celebrity yes <laughs> right <laughs> You're a that's what I'm trying to do I mean the yeah. whole thing with me joining Putri Indonesia was to just at least bring the awareness that um, literacy is important that we as a country we're so illiterate and we we need to uplift this problem because it's so underrated yeah and, and I, I look at literacy as one where you don't just read or right. Exactly. I think literacy ought to be defined as a place where you can actually read, write, undertake risks, and manage risks. Mm. That's a definition of literacy mm. in totality, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, for me, it's, you know, your ability to understand the world, understand each other, to communicate, mm. to be able to process information around you. But the, Betul. And if people are not literate, they can't even process what's on social media. Yeah. You know, we are just given information and we believe it. There's so yeah. many hoax and so many false information yeah. going around and we're all consuming the same thing. Yeah. So it's just. It's yeah. called the post-truth era where yeah. people fail to separate facts yeah. from fiction. 
And and with algorithms and AI, you know, we're only being fed the things that yeah. they think that we like. So yeah. we're so limited in our imagination these yeah. days, right? That is so true. And we lack the imagination. Yeah. And we can break away from that by yeah. the ability to diversifying imagine. the books mm-hmm. that we're reading. Yeah. And 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 I'm I'm not accepting of the fact that people keep equating algorithmic amplica- amplification with democracy. Mm. Right? These algorithms that we've been talking about, they actually amplify certain narratives that are <laughs> divisive, mm. right? That are polarizing. And as if we're supposed to call them or equate them with democracy, mm-hmm. it's, it's not healthy. No. And, and, and I think democracy is in a recession in many places, in the US, Western European yeah. countries, and others. Uh, it needs to be, I think, taken a view off by the young generation. Saya mau ngobrol mengenai isu-isu apa selain baca yang menurut anda itu penting sekali untuk disikapi anak-anak muda ke depan. I mean, you are what 27. So what what would you want your fellow 27 year olds and younger to think about what's cool in the future? What's cool for the future? I think uh, what's cool in the future is to be able to stay true to your who you are, your your roots. Do not lose track of of yourself, of of our history, of our culture, and to take that in, to take that with us to the future with technology along with us. Okay, do you sense that your generation understands Indonesia's history? Um, enough? I don't think so. Yeah. Kenapa? Not enough. Kenapa dan gimana? Karena mungkin Harus. kita mengerti tentang history yang uh, diajarkan di sekolah ya sejarah, hmm. but not the history that our ancestors knows about. Not hmm. not about our connection with nature, bukan yang um, Karifan local, you know those kind of histories like mythology and and the things that we don't fully understand, but it's been with us and it's shaped us as who we are now that yeah. we've forgotten about. Isn't there a sense that the richness of our history is not adequately documented? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Which and correlates with the fact that the culture of writing mm-hmm. is shallow. Mm-hmm. The culture of reading is shallow, mm-hmm. right? This is, I think, a, 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 an explanation for the broader narrative. Why I think the West was able to call it supersede the Eastern culture for a couple of hundred years or what? Because the West was able to document yeah. their wisdom, their knowledge, whatever, right? But mm-hmm. it's not too late, right, for Indonesia mm-hmm. to start documenting. Yeah, I and mean, we need to start now. I mean, um, one form of preserving our culture or, you know, we we don't write it, but we have it in the forms of performance. Yeah. Um, like in Bali, we have the traditional dances that yeah. tells a story. Yeah. But that just stayed there Betul. until now. Dan we didn't take that in. Dari orang tua ke anak, dari yeah. anak ke cucu, dan lain-lain. Ya kan? Yeah, Tapi dan cerita word of, mouth, word of Tuh, mouth, word of mouth, performance, songs. Um, but now we need to understand the importance of writing. Mm. And we need to start now. Yeah, I, I agree. I think art history is is, a, is an, an essential yeah. part of what we are and how we've become what we are. And how we can become what we yeah. want to be. And and we've realized that the history that we know of were written by the ones that were in power at the time. But now we can all write. We Maybe can all do bias. it. <laughs> yeah. Noise. I mean, can you imagine yeah. just not f- like now the things that we know of the past were because of a certain people. So if we don't write it ourselves now, we don't write what's happening right now at the mo- uh, current time. In the future, our kids won't know about it. Mm. They would know our, our our stories from a perspective of just a few selected people. Yeah. What else? That was the first or issue. Maybe, or maybe people don't see the importance of writing because they're documenting things now through photos, 
Um, but I think we need more than that. We need more photos. We need more than just photos and videos. Yeah, they're, they're documenting the food that they're eating. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of, you know, what medical explanation hey, for what happened at least write the recipe right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at least like your future kids <laughs> you know can do, yeah. try to make it and yeah. taste yeah. it just the way it it's tastes history. exactly i mean if you've done this for 20 years right i mean what what has sunken into your mind about what could be done better untuk kepentingan sastra for yeah, the importance yeah. of literature in indonesia our ability to document things our ability to read and write better I suppose, I mean, I suppose for me, I mean, to be honest, I don't read much in, in Indonesian. Um, yeah. And I always wish that we could be more part of um, translation of Indonesian yeah. work. That that for me is something we've been talking about, how to how to start that. Right. Um, at least uh, to, by translating it, then you reach a wider audience. I know maybe some people think, well, why should we translate it? It was so I can read it, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, um, and also I think if you have young writers, if they have that option to get their work translated, that's quite a, a nice incentive. Yeah. But even just to publish it, of course, is another great thing. So, um, but I guess for me, I just would love to see more Indonesian work on the shelves around the world, you know, because yeah. when you go to bookstores, there's um, mm. very little. Yeah. And, say no um, more. Yeah. And if you ask people on the street, um, name a few Indonesian writers. I was talking to John McGlynn about this. Um, well, he said in within Indonesia itself, if you ask people on the street to name 10 Indonesian writers, they would struggle. Uh, and then if you... Wow. Yeah, the two then. Yeah, I mean, you had the problem in the 80s about. Actually, that's a great observation. Yeah, yeah, question. yeah. Name me 10 Indonesian. Top, or just any 10 mm. Indonesian authors. Okay, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I could probably name six. Yeah. But I can't do 10. Yeah. And I also was telling you that I have a problem. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed that I don't know enough Indonesian writers and I don't read enough Indonesian books. But is that my fault? Is that the fault of my generation? Or is it also because we simply don't have enough writers yeah. and books All of that above. interest us? All of right? the above. So it's a right. bit of a dilemma. But, but I think we can start now and do better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. yeah. And, and I, you know, I've been quite vocal about the need for Indonesians to speak international languages, right? One of which is English. Mm -hmm. and, and I say English at the risk of being criticized. It's because most of the wisdom and knowledge throughout the world would have been written in English, unfortunately or fortunately. Mm -hmm. And most economic activities throughout the world are undertaken in English. Mm -hmm. If you live in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you want to trade with somebody in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. The trade is not done in Afghan, nor Ethiopian, nor Mandarin, nor Japanese, nor Italian. More than likely, it's going to be done in English. Yes. So yes. there is a vested interest, right, to explore. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a vested interest to basically expand the economic pie by engaging in economic activities with as many people as possible mm -hmm. around the world. So I would, I would guess that there's probably no more than 5% of the population of Indonesia that could speak English mm -hmm. or international language fluently. You being one of them, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> For and me, language is a complex thing. Not really. I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes where we could actually teach somebody in Flores to be proficient in three months mm. to the point he could get a job and put food on the table for a family of six. Yeah. Three months. But um, I think for me, language is very complex, especially in Indonesia, because um, I heard from the writer Felix Felix Nessie. Nessie. Yeah. He said that it's very hard even for him coming from Entete. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Entete.
for him to write in Indonesian simply because a lot of the words he cannot even translate to Indonesian, let alone English. Wow. Wow. So I think it's also complex because if you talk to translators, yeah, you know, how yeah. do you translate Rumi's yeah. poetry into English? It takes a while, right? You also have to understand the context. You have to understand the emotion that goes into it. Yeah. The current mm. period of time it was written. All these little factors to translate it into one single language. It's it's pretty hard, yeah. in my opinion. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. But I, wa I want to go back to the earlier oh. point, though. How about... If a hundred million Indonesians mm -hmm. speak international languages, don't you think that would be awesome? I mean, it would definitely open up Indonesia to the world. Exactly. I believe that we're the most um, invisible, one of the largest and most invisible countries in the world. Absolutely. We're the fourth largest country, Absolutely. but I think we have so to be many open people don't know about us. About this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that because of language or... Yes, I do believe that language is it's, a factor. It's predominantly it's because huge, of language. Yes, yes. We're not telling the story about ourselves yeah. to too. the rest of the world. Yeah, but even the yeah. ones that do speak English, yeah. are they writing about us? Are they doing anything I to... I am, but <laughs> you know, very few are. <laughs> exactly. Right? So language is a big factor, but it doesn't have to be just an, an excuse for now. What are we going to do? No, I take your it? point. I think, I think you're solidifying my point in the sense that if more and more, if not a lot more Indonesians were to master any international language, there's mm -hmm. hope for telling the story about Indonesia better and more. Only if they read and write. Yeah, Absolutely. That's my point, right? It has right? to I go mean, hand this is, in hand. This is what Wood Writers yes. Festival is all yes. about, right? This is about the aspiration of ushering this new culture of reading more than 280 characters mm -hmm. ushering the new culture of writing more than 280 characters right mm -hmm. we're talking about two to three hundred pages worth of thoughts mm -hmm. i don't care if you use chat gpt for starters but you can perfect that mm -hmm. by humanizing it and humanizing it you can basically undertake whatever form of hypnosis upon the hallucinations that are going to be done by the ai Right. But that's a good start. Mm -hmm. And the other good start, I think, is really being able to communicate mm -hmm. yeah. in international languages on the basis that a lot of most of the knowledge, most of the wisdom around the world is documented in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot in Chinese, but there's a lot more in English. Right. And Agreed. most of the economic activities around the world are done in English. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is... I feel like I'm talking more here. <laughs> <We're just laughs> doing it. No, but good, I'm thinking. The, yeah. I'm thinking. The, the good thing is AI can help accelerate that process. I think we also have to look back in time. Hmm. We have to see um, how the Roman civilization became so big. We have to look at the role of the Latin language. Yeah. I think like we're going through something similar, but instead of Latin, it's English. Yeah. The global language currency of the care. time, of the moment. If, if Javanese is the most <laughs> used language around the world, mm -hmm. I'll teach anybody around me to mm -hmm. learn Javanese. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Yeah. If it would have been Latin, Roman, Mandarin, Japanese, mm -hmm. Portuguese, or Italian, or Spanish, yeah. mm -hmm. I would tell anybody to just, you know, because but, yes, we I, want to be more knowledgeable. Yeah. I think this is a very in important and interesting conversation for people of my generation. Yeah. Because we're speaking more and more English now. Yeah. But then at the same yeah. time, we're also being, in a way, criticized or judged for being able to speak um, better English sometimes yeah. than Indonesian. Me, for yeah. instance, as how do you, Indonesia. How do you take on that criticism? Kalau kalau dikritik sama orang Indonesia, ni orang banget ngomong bahasa Inggris mulu, nggak pernah ngomong bahasa Indonesia. Dibilangnya Daxel, right? But kalau saya bercanda, ya saya bilang aja kan saya putri Indonesia, bukan putri bahasa Indonesia. Putri Indonesia ini memiliki mungkin lebih global perspective. I can see that becoming a short YouTube short. Is it? Is it my fault? Can you blame me that I um, had the opportunity to go abroad for eight years since I was 16 um, yeah. to to study abroad where I predominantly use English? So I yeah. started thinking in, in English. That's yeah. why 
um, speaking in Indonesian was a struggle for me coming back from abroad. Yeah. It's just because simply it's just easier for me, much more efficient and faster to get my ideas out in English. Yeah. Bahwasanya Anda akhirnya balik. Dan akhirnya balik. tetap mengakar di sini dan keluar negeri untuk mewakili kepentingan Indonesia. Itu kan membuktikan bahwa Anda tuh sangat Indonesianis. Iya yeah, kan? My values as Indonesian is still very strong. Yeah. It's just I have this language barrier. Ya. Yeah. Tapi saya belajar, Pak. <laughs> Dan saya juga bisa bahasa Bali. Ya, Makanya bahasa saya Indonesia saya 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 aku. Kalau mau ngomong Bali jangan di sini. I grew up in Bali. I know I grew up in Kalau mau bahasa Indonesia dengan lagat Bali boleh. Nah, Tapi boleh. jangan lah. Tapi kan saya tuh besarnya di Ubud ya, Pak. Ya. Jadi sama bapak itu bahasa, pakai bahasa Bali. Okay. Sama my mom pakai bahasa Inggris dari kecil. Oh. Bahasa Indonesianya cuma di sekolah. Ya. Hmm. Jadi no, um, beda. beda. Yeah. Oke, okay. sejarah hmm. itu isu pertama. Yang kedua isu apa lagi? Yang menurut Anda generasi muda itu harus kuasai atau paham? I just feel anak muda sekarang itu harus lebih banyak memiliki sensibility towards things beyond than beyond other than themselves or um, other than what's happening on social media. I think they just need to have more sensibility towards nature. I don't know if it's because my influence of living in Italy I have a bigger sensibility towards nutrition, health, my food, um, appreciating You're about sensitivity quality. or sensibility? Sensibility. Okay. All right. Just being more sensible about things. Okay. So there's access. Sensitivity. There is access action, excessive action towards certain things by your generation that needs to be made more sensible. No, I don't think there's access. Um, I just think that, you know, we we need to be more educated on what's really important in life. Okay. Being sensible about things, about where right. our food is coming from. This is just a small example. Yeah. Appreciating quality. Yeah. Uh, understanding what life is about, what's truly important for us. Yeah. Um, it's It's our health. It's how we feel, it's our environment, it's our relationship with people, it's yeah. the time that we have, it's the time we have to spend with our family and all these things that, that I feel like was so strongly present uh, in Italy where I was living for yeah. four years, but not here. And uh, maybe even less um, also in Italy for the younger generation. So I think we need to keep this. We need to um, remember that You know what's important in life is at the end connection, our experiences, our time. This is more of a lifestyle thing that needs to be altered for the better. Mm, I think it's also spirituality, mm. understanding uh, the wow. world, mm. philosophy. Mm. Yeah, it's what uh, it adding, take? injecting more philosophy into our I, lives. I, I'm with you. What what it what would it take for your generation and the younger ones to? better philosophize or to philosophize more i feel very lucky because i got it from my parents especially my dad <laughs> my dad <laughs> let's give credit to my dad for once <laughs> my father <laughs> my husband <laughs> okay yeah um he would always tell me stories about um spirituality tell me stories about you know balinese hinduism and Like just talking about what's most important things in life, what's important, which is, you know, dharma, adharma, what you do for other people, and all these things. Just connecting mm -hmm. with the, <laughs> yeah. Keep on. The, ma the material world. That's one thing, my father. The other was my experience living in Italy. That gave you a bit more... Philosophical, appreciation, whatever. Appreci appreciation towards life, okay. beyond the materialistic world, beyond um, social media, our phones. 
yeah, just appreciating things where it came from, the food that we consume. Mainly it was the food <laughs> because yeah. I was in Italy. But what what, what but, benefits have accrued to you by way of becoming or being more philosophical or sensitizing yourself with philosophy? That I can just feel better about myself. I feel yeah. like I'm becoming a good person. Um, there's there's a lot a lot of things. It's mainly mainly for me first how I can feel settled. Yeah. With the life that I'm living in, with the yeah. body that I'm in. Yeah. Because me as a Balinese, we believe that we are a soul. And I have a lot of questions about life. Mm. And I think many young people do. We struggle to understand why we're here. And that's the role of philosophy. Yeah. To make us feel okay and to make us feel like we're not lost. We know where we're going. We know what we're doing. We know what's the purpose of life. What's, how do you define enough? How do I define yourself? enough? Because that, that I think is pretty Zen, right? I mean, the young generation have difficulty in defining enough <laughs> of many things. Well, I'm young, so I still I'm talking also, to you. Yeah. I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I can ask Janet the same question. Have you had enough? No. <laughs> I, mean, what, I mean, what? how do you develop the ability to say that it's enough, that you're content? Since we're on a subject of philosophy, it's here. very interesting. I don't think yeah. I'm ever content because so. sometimes I'm like, <laughs> sometimes yeah. uh, enough is like understanding that there's limitation to things. You're told not to be on your phone too much. So once you realize that you're on your phone too much, you tell yourself, "Okay, that's enough." Yeah. But that's coming ex from external sources. You're told that you shouldn't be on your phone more than an hour. Yeah, and then you say to yourself, "That's enough." Okay. But I think enough is being able to define yourself, how things are to your advantage, mm. how things can add value to your life, how things make you feel content, truly from inside. But is, has there been a moment or an episode where you didn't get what you wanted, but you were able to tell yourself, I'm cool with it? You can't always get what you want. Some Mick Jagger. <clears throat> what do you think? I, to be honest, struggled to communicate as a kid. And I often felt like because I couldn't communicate what I really wanted, I often didn't get what I want. So I just buried it inside. Mm. And um, tried to just act cool. But but what what ability did you develop that allowed you to be calm with it? Well, it's a very uh, <laughs> difficult question. What ability that? I mean, you that... brought up philosophy, right? So I'm trying to get you to philosophize a little okay. bit more. Um, I mean, I, I can tell you what and how I define enough. If please. I know I've if I know I've done my best, I've done my most, and I prayed for it and i mm -hmm. still don't get it a class i'm yeah. content yeah i think that's you know, also don't push it and i can mm. still sleep that's also how i've been dealing with things just understanding that um there's not one way to roam there's yeah. many ways yeah. so if you are rejected or you don't get what you want at one point you know there's other things that you can do and you move on and you just trust that it's not meant for you and you trust that there are greater things ahead waiting for you. Yeah. What about you, Janet? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. <laughs> um, I don't know about everything. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you're married, to, you're married to a philosopher, so yeah, you yeah. got to have some philosophical Yeah, my dad touch. has a PhD in Hindu philosophy. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm really not philosophical, so um, I don't She's have She's Australian. A, I'm Australian, I don't have a, <laughs> She's about to crack some jokes. <laughs> Yeah, nice. No, Good day, mate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know um, if I ever think enough is enough. Anyway, I'm trying to think. When have I thought, okay, that's enough? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just push myself continually. So, um, well, I, I, just I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting yeah, that yeah. we all give up, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. 
I don't but know I think I'm... there's got to be a point when you know you keep breathing and hitting a brick wall, mm. and you just gotta either go yeah. around the wall or just chill. I just had an interesting thought. You know, we always think that philosophy is such a heavy topic. It's this heavy thing, but actually, it shouldn't be. I remember my dad would always say, yeah. "Like, don't take life too seriously." Yeah, that's how we move on. Yeah, mm. just santai aja. Betul, <laughs> betul. Yeah, kan? santai. Yeah. And, and philosophy is really about investigating pre-existing truth, right? And if you dare not investigate pre-existing truth, then you cannot philosophize, mm-hmm. right? What I mean by that is I think there's some element of critical thinking that's required for you to philosophize. Mm-hmm. You got yeah. you gotta be able to think critically. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a statement from one of our guests earlier that having the cognitive capacity is key. But if you combine that with emotive capacity by way of reading a lot on literature, philosophy, history, and stuff like that, that will increase your emotive capacity. Talk a little bit about how understanding or studying philosophy can make a person richer. Mm -hmm. I think we have to make peace with the fact that we cannot know everything. We cannot be the smartest person in the world. One of the greatest advice I was um, given to was that before I went to Miss Universe, um, someone told me that, okay, there's going to be 80 girls there. They're all going to be smart, beautiful. But what you want to do is to show yourself as the wisest person. And I think that's such a special quality to have because we cannot be the most intelligent person. What for if we are not good human beings? Even Albert Einstein talks about you know, imagination, creativity, mm. having mm. a heart, doing the right thing. Yeah. Because um, edu- uh, knowledge is not everything. Knowledge is is power, but it's not. It doesn't guarantee you to have a good life. It doesn't guarantee that when you're done with your life, it will add value to you. You'll be happy. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of the struggles that we're facing now is mental health issues because we forget that emotive qualities are so important. What what are some of the little steps that, you know, the young generation could take to better philosophize? Yeah. And again, I was going to expand on that saying that reading is one way for us to really connect with humanity as well as writing. Um, one of the best um, Indonesian writer, Bapak Putuoka Sukanta, yes, yeah. talks about mm. how writing makes you more human. Yeah. And he told me the story that I was so fascinated by. When he grew up, he was dirt poor. He grew up in Bali. He had nothing. He didn't even own a pen and a paper. But he became and grown to be this amazing writer. He told me that he wrote everything in his mind. And when he went to prison or so, one way for him to feel like a human being was to write. And I think for us to be more wise, more emotional, and to understand philosophy is digging deep within ourselves by not just reading, but also writing. Um, It's a form of us to communicate, not just to other people, but to ourselves. Because we also struggle to understand ourselves. What for if we're smart, but we don't know what we want in life? We don't understand who we are. So I think we need to really start reflecting more and um, using books and pen and paper as tools for becoming better and doing better for our world. We've we've touched yeah. upon art history. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've touched upon philosophy. Mm-hmm. You talked a little bit about sustainability. Mm-hmm. Peel the onion. Um, 
For young people, I think it's important. Of course, now we don't want to be talking about sustainability. Yeah. We don't want to be uh, volunteering or be an activist at such mm. an early age. But we have no other option yeah. because it's our future that's at stake. Um, we we need to be really demanding more um, sustainable actions, sustainable policies from governments, businesses, and all these things. Do, do you think there is Let's enough activism that. at the grassroots level? I think there's... Or, or would you think that mm-hmm. the activism, activism is more at the elite level? No, I think there's not enough activism in person, in real life. That doesn't have to be shown on social media. There's a lot going on on Mm. social media and social media amplifies it. But when you go into your day-to-day life, there's nothing going on. So there's not enough activism that is truly just activism that is not on social media, that is in our day-to-day life, in real life. There's not enough. So you sense that there's excessive virtue signaling. Yes. Right? Not corroborated by actual action. Yeah. I would or say commensurate that, action. Yeah. And I would say there's enough if I myself can personally see it on a daily basis, understand it on a daily basis. Yeah. What what do you think explains that? Well, just the fact that we are really living so much on our devices. It goes back to my old point. Yeah, we live so much on our devices that we see um, for an hour all these posts about mm. activism and sustainability. And then we think that our whole day has been evolving around that. But when we turn it off, there's nothing going on in our real <laughs> lives. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of what I call armchair activists, you know, who um, you claim to be activists, I guess, yeah, through social media as well. But right. again, they're not really doing anything. Um, yeah, that's kind of uh, the social media yeah. dilemma too. Yeah, yeah and then there, there is a bit of hypocrisy, mm. right, within the sustainability space. I'm not saying there's, I think there's a lot of genuine, mm. you know, public intellectuals within that space who are thinking and trying to make things happen. Mm-hmm. But there's also a lot that are just riding on this, you know, bandwagon for yes. purposes of virtue signaling. Mm. When the classic example is, you know, those that have been talking about climate change are actually flying around on private jets. Yeah, that's mm. right. Yeah. I mean, that's a mockery. Mm. I and mean, that's hypocrisy mm. at its best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yes. But but my question is really about how do we get activism uplifted at the grassroots level? In, in in the kind of scale that we want to. But do we want activism to be lifted on a grassroots level? Do. Or do we want the leaders of the world to do more? The businesses? Well, I think the leaders of the world are trying. At least they're trying with their rhetoric. You think? Because uh, I was at the Net Zero mm. Summit the other day, and yeah. everyone was saying that we just need more political will. So it seems like there's not enough political will. It seems like they're not doing enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is that most of the politicians, they're shackled, right? Mm. By the cycle of five years or the cycle of four years. We call that political cycles mm-hmm. or political processes. And when you're shackled by cycles of four years or five years, you can't afford to think about a time frame that's 30, 40, 50 years, mm-hmm. right? So there is a contradiction and there mm. is this irreconcilable nature between what matters for the politician and what matters for the planet. Mm. That makes it very difficult. So I, I would depoliticize this. Yeah, I think so. Well, it's difficult for us too, Pagita, because for example, I want to be more sustainable. I want to buy only organic fruits, but it's but, expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know no, no, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. But I want to I wanna, um, do recycling properly, but if I decided to subscribe to someone who picks up my organic compost, it's costing me money from my own pocket. I agree. The government is not subs- subsidizing that for me. I agree. And it's not just the leaders that are having it hard. We're also having it hard. We want to do more, do better, but... Sometimes it's costly for us and we have our limitations. I'm, I'm not going to be taking a 24-hour train yeah. from Jakarta to Bali 
Yeah. No, no, I, I, I agree. To uh, much less myself, walking, right? right? I mean, you, you'd save yeah. you'd save yeah. the planet from carbonization by yeah. walking from Jakarta to by Bali. By walking, but would you do that? <laughs> I mean, it might take you two and a half weeks to yeah, get there. Exactly. Uh, no, no. I, I, I think that's that's a really extreme way of yeah. showing activism, uh, activism, right? But what I mean by activism is not in the sense of getting as many people as possible to buy organic stuff or to walk to work or whatever, mm -hmm. but, but at least understanding, mm. right? How, of a con how much of a concern carbonization is, mm -hmm. you know, for the planet. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think people understand enough about the, sh the issue at hand, because I think they're preoccupied with, trying to put food on a table yes right they can't afford to think about this fancy dandy narrative of yeah. sustainability right? well yeah. that's why i think that sustainability itself should be an industry we need to shift a lot of our industries to be more green and understand how we can monetize from being more sustainable and we can't do this alone everyone yeah. has to join forces i agree but moving together at getting, the same time. getting as many people as possible to embrace this new green narrative or green technology narrative, it needs scalability, right? Meaning the adoption yes. of this new green technology needs to be scalable. Mm -hmm. And for this to be scalable, it needs to be affordable. The yeah. problem is it's not, it's not affordable for most people, as you yeah. happily pointed out earlier. Where do we find that point where, you know, we can enter to, for everyone to be able to, become more sustainable in a way at the same time so that it can be scalable. I, I don't think it's going to be instantaneous. Yeah. It, it will take require time. time Absolutely. Right? And it's a new challenge for all of us. For everybody around yes. the planet, right? It's something new that we're facing. Yeah. So it's not easy. So once you get people to understand, yes, you, depolit you depoliticize this, you get people to understand, then you get them to take ownership of what's important the future then you start politicizing it mm -hmm. right and and I, I i'm of the view that i think many in the regulatory framework many in the political framework they don't have the kind of comprehension of this issue mm -hmm. as much as they should as much as perhaps the experts of sustainability yeah yeah then I think we have too many focus. We we are unable to focus on sustainability because, you know, as you said, there's other so many factors around that that is more important for many people. Right? Yeah. But but I, I think there are some practical steps that can be taken, right? Mm -hmm. What would it take for people to actually walk to work? What would it take for people to when they go home they they turn Money. off the lights, you know. Money. <laughs> Money. Oh, we'll subsidize you to go home and walk home. People will do it. <laughs> Credit. Yeah, but there's no money. Yeah, there's, you know, no, there's, that's there's the limited dilemma. money supply. There's limited, you know, ability of most governments around the world to mm -hmm. subsidize. Unless well, you're China, unless you're Germany, unless you're Canada, unless mm -hmm. you're United States or Australia, right? Okay, apalagi. I think, well, <laughs> think about that. Yeah. people need to, to be scared. <laughs> people need to, to understand that Same. there's a threat and then there's a danger of um, the climate crisis. So how can we create enough urgency for people to want to do more um, or better for, for the future, for their children? How do you think you can create that kind of insecurity amongst many people without causing panic? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about causing insecurity, yeah. not panic. How? I mean, if we're talking about a huge amount of people, we have to somehow look into pop culture, maybe. Yeah. Popularity. We need to do something, perhaps a movie, which starts probably in writing. Yeah. So perhaps books that talks yeah. about the dangers mm -hmm. of the climate crisis, um, a speculative yeah. dystopian future um, novel that can 
warn us against the things that we're currently doing, the business as usual that warns us that that's not good enough, that's endangering our existence in this world. Would describe the dystopia that you have in mind with regards to sustainability. How bad could it get? Well, we are going to be extinct. <laughs> <laughs> before before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, before it got really out of hand, I was reading the book Severance by Ling Ma. Mm. And that's a dystopian novel talking about a virus that infected many people and ob obliterated um, her city and then eventually the world. So someone who who's a writer who's interested or have knowledge in in uh, climate change should should write something about that. I can't think of a scenario, but <laughs> yeah, I can just put ideas of people should write about this and that. Janet, you got to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Which authors that you've seen, you've met, you've listened to, heard, or whatever, who could make an impact in Indonesia on any issue that matters in the long term, in the long run? Let me think about that because uh, you mean an Indonesian writer, or let's start international? with Indonesia because the yeah. universe is not that big, right? Yeah. Then we'll expand that into the international universe. Well, I mean, again, it has to be someone young. Yeah. Um, Siapa? Who who impresses you most? In terms of the way they connect with people, yeah. etc. Um, as a writer, I th I'm very fond of Dewi Lestari. Okay. Very um, dear friend. Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, I think what, what do you think makes her special? Uh, I think because she she didn't start off from a literary background. She was a singer, yeah, and then um, started a to really write a great singer, too. a really great singer, mm. yeah, and then started to write these novels that are more about well, more spiritual and all of that, um, yeah, and just I think she just connected with people. Um, a bit more like the Palo Coelho kind of on that sort of spiritual journey, et cetera. So I think uh, she has a huge following, obviously, yeah. and connects really well with young people. So I think that's what we're looking for, for someone who connects and uh, communicates in a really um, egalitarian kind of warm way, you know, that, mm. that everybody feels included in, you know. Inclusive. Kalau menurut saya yang mungkin bisa melakukan perubahan uh, adalah bukan penyair, bukan penulis. Perhaps the president himself, if he came up with the book after his his reign is over, his time at the office is over, he could he might be able to create a huge impact, a shift in Given mindset. Given his popularity. Given his popularity. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, right. Mm. Bapak Jokowi, yeah. mohon dicoba untuk menulis bukunya, <laughs> Pak. <laughs> Or you yeah. could be the co-author. Along okay. with uh, Darmawan Prastojo, because he wrote his first English biography, uh, yeah. autobiography. Really? Yes. It's a really good book. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. I gotta ask you this. Yeah. When you look at a, a writer... Does it make a difference between his writing a biography of himself or writing on other things? Does that define the quality of that author? I'm trying to think of the, like a novelist who has also done that. Yeah. Um, although I suppose it's people like Amitav Ghosh who has written uh, stories about his life, you know, when he was yeah. in Egypt things like that, okay. um, which really uh, added to him as a writer, in fact, because now he's also writing about climate change. So yeah. um, his uh, whole kind of body of work is fascinating and um, I think he's uh, growing in his um, ability to write or just uh, the fact that he's, He's done the autobiography, but also novels, and then again about climate change, etc. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I mean, if they have an interesting life, you know, <laughs> um, makes it more interesting. I don't know. Um, okay. Let's go yeah. back to the Indonesian universe. <laughs> so you were kind of like murmuring in the back about, you know, mm-hmm. doing some sort of a book club. So um, that I thought is, it's a pretty cool idea. So if people, somebody were to do a book club, right? The way Oprah does it. Yeah. Um, I think what's so cool about our current generation is that there's so many new business ideas mm. and people need to uh, be more creative and find different ways that are not traditional to monetize things. Yeah. Well, I started a book club on Instagram and during the pandemic, that was quite trendy. And I wanted to help my mom's writers festival to be more present online uh, especially on social media. So I volunteered to host um, an annual, no, sorry, not annual, a okay. weekly book club, actually. Really? So for wow. about a couple yeah. of months, I was hosting um, a weekly book club where I would Online. read yeah. on Instagram. I would read one book a week and I would invite uh, popular uh, guest stars uh, like Asmara Abigail, for example. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to understand more about book clubs in general. And I did a lot of research. And of course, I started the book club on IG Live because I was inspired by Kaya Gerber, mm-hmm. um, daughter of Cindy Crawford. She also started hosting an, an IG book club. And then I, I was also inspired by Oprah Winfrey. And then I found out Reese Witherspoon has a book club. and. I was just so fascinated by the fact that she is such a smart lady who mm. didn't yeah. start a book club just for fun. Yeah, uh, She started the book club to mm. actually also help writers, right. but also she monetizes the whole thing. Yeah. So she would buy exclusive rights from the pl- publishers of these books. And then she would go to Netflix, propose the idea. She would create the content. She would create the, the TV show or movie that one emmy awards and then she would monetize the whole thing and then she would go back and then um buy buy more rights for books and keep going and it still is going now she has 2.5 million subscribe followers on instagram for her book club and she is i believe one of the wealthiest actresses Mm. in hollywood yeah she's a billionaire and people need to understand that you can make money from books (laughs) You can yeah. monetize things. You can That's do amazing. whatever whatever it is you're passionate about and f- be creative, find ways to make it work. This is really punchy. I like and this. D- Dua Lipa also. Yeah. Dua Lipa is also She's, very yeah. involved yeah. in uh, in a book club. No, she she I think starting her book club on Service ninety five, wow. which is a platform or digital magazine that wow. she created. She's starting her book club there, but she's very involved with the Booker Prize. And she's very um, active in the literary scene. And, and she's probably an avid reader. She right? is. Yeah, yeah so she is. What, what makes these people special and magnetic is that they're genuine. They're genuine. Readers. They're passionate about Oprah it. Oprah is a genuine reader. Yes. Reads to. And they be- really Dua believe Lipa. in the power of books. Yeah. You know, a book is a square object. Yeah. Pieces of paper with writings on it. But, I mean, I'm sure you've read a book before. Once you open it, you read, like, the words and all these things, you you get completely transformed and um, transported into a different world. Yeah. It's just so simple People find me weird because I read books. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? Me too. (laughs) Me too. Especially in Jakarta. Like, oh, you read books. (laughs) (laughs) But it's interesting too how at the moment um, more translated books are being read. Yeah, I think that Indonesian maybe, to English or English to Indonesian. Uh, just around around the world, maybe not Indonesian as much, but uh, the rest of the world is tra- yeah. Chinese tra- to reading English, Korean. Chinese reading or Hungarian more, yeah, or whatever yeah, translated and to more English. More readers right? of translated work. And so, more than likely into English, right? Yeah, yeah, See, absolutely. It goes back to the earlier absolutely. stuff, right? Yeah. Most stuff is documented in English. Yeah. Mm. Well, one of my favorite um, book that was just like a collection of essays written by Nina Minya Powells, the young writer from, 
she's from New Zealand, but yeah. then her mom or father's from Malaysia yeah. and then China. So she's mm. a little bit like me. She's from all over the place. She wrote it mainly in English, but then she would incorporate um, some Kiwi words in there, some Chinese, some some Malaysian. So, you know, sometimes a book doesn't have to be one language. Yeah. Yeah. True, true. That's a bit of a yeah. trend too, to incorporate. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. What's, what's the most number of languages you're going to have in a book? I would like... That. Oh, gosh, not sure. <laughs> I don't know about that, but normally but if it's their own... Many. I think Just, she had three, and yeah. um, the book's called what Bodies languages? of Water. What languages? Uh, Chinese. Book? Okay. So she... One part of the essay, she was in China. She had Chinese characters in the book, but she explained everything. It totally makes sense. Um, there was uh, the Kiwi language because she also grew up in New Zealand. Now, for those that don't understand Mandarin, how would they? I understood. I read it. I read the book. There was like the characters, but then explanation. In English. In English. Cool. So you, you interviewed her as well. I interviewed her for the, for for the, writers, the festival. writers' festival online. Wow. Yeah. online. She's a really interesting young writer based in she's the UK. She's a great writer. Yeah, she's cute. Actually, this book club idea is fantastic. Yeah. I think yeah. somebody like you ought to do it. So, yeah, the idea is just to um, create a book club with the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival to bring up Indonesian writers. Yeah. And young writers. I just writers. can't see this happening with... You know, somebody fly by night, you know, who never read books and no, no. tries to monetize <laughs> and oops, okay, no. I'm doing a book club. No, you know, no, but it's said. it's gotta be somebody yeah. who genuinely yeah. you know, practices reading, mm. you know, and is passionate about this. I, yeah. I sense that you're very passionate about reading. <laughs> Comes from the mom <laughs> and yeah. the father. I mean, I try to read as much as I can, but of course sometimes, you know, it's hard for me. Um Right now, with all the work I have to do, and also I feel like, you know, my focus is narrowing down mm. with social media. We have a shorter attention span. Yeah. It's been really challenging. But because, Terrible. but the book club actually helps a lot because mm. then you have mm. to be accountable. Okay. You have a deadline. I yeah. have to read the book. Yeah. So I actually really, really like book clubs. And if you struggle with finishing a book or reading... Join a book club. Yeah, true. It's going to be much more, much more exciting. It's actually yeah. really entertaining. It's like you um, watching a TV series and then you meet your friend the next day and you talk about it again. It's, a, it's the same with the yeah, book club. That's nice. Yeah. But I think once, once you start reading, um, you just get into that pattern as well. When you, if you were with the book club and having to read, well, then you just get into that pattern of reading more. I think yes, and you read more. Really good. Yeah. You both should do it. Yeah, you, you've, been, you've been doing this for 20 years. I mean, yeah. you should yeah. expand on this. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's 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 really cool. I mean, in terms of getting more and more people to mm. read. And businesses should also get along with it. Publishers, um, bookstores, because Oprah alone managed to sell 50 million oh, copies man. or more like since she started yeah. the book club she can sell anything she can sell anything <laughs> and the, the good thing about her is she's very selective on what she decides mm. to yes. sell right because people believe yeah, in her yeah. conscience yes right and that mm. that's what makes her special mm. similarly with reese not sure about dua lipa mm. but i think we'll find out yeah we'll find out <laughs> Okay, we've talked about art history, philosophy, <laughs> sensibility, sustainability, book club. What else? Well. What do you think is important for humanity or Indonesia in the long run? I, I just want to talk about what's good for the long run. Well, I mean, we are talking about spiritual leaders before um, and just the whole spiritual kind of uh, movement. I think that is an interesting um, well, I mean, because we were just watching that Jay Shetty before and looking at uh, these people that um, talk about lifestyle and spirituality and how to make the, the most in life, things like that. I mean, I'm not sure in Indonesia who we have who's like that. Um, 
but I guess that's what people need right now, that kind of guidance. And I think COVID too um, brought those sort of messages and looking after your health and, Mm. um, yeah, and also the importance of family and your loved ones. So maybe we are all getting towards that kind of more spiritual, philosophical kind of way. And maybe we, we are, we do seek or we need some sort of leader that's going to take us along mm-hmm. with them. I think <laughs> I was going to say, what you mentioned leader, yeah. that, you know, as Indonesians, especially the young ones, we need to know what we want. We need to know what we want from the leaders. We need to demand and voice out what we want from the leaders. How do we want Indonesia to be in 2045? Everyone's talking about Indonesia emas 2045. Mm-hmm. But we need to define it ourselves because we're going to be living in that time if uh, the world didn't collapse. Well, define it for us. I mean, the show is all about 2045. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, first we need to decarbonize. <laughs> Okay, because not realistic. I think 2050 is the fastest. 2050 is the yeah. fastest. Um, Decarbonize to the extent that we achieve carbon neutrality, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we want to uh, not keep experiencing these extreme weathers. Mm. Mm-hmm. I personally don't want to um, live in a place where I feel sick. I don't want the pollution to get worse. I want my environment to be well. I really believe in well-being in the sense that um, everything is performing well. Everything is is good. It's running well. Not just you know, not just like health related stuff and skincare and beauty. Well-being in in a more holistic sense. That that's the future that I want to be in. I want more security for myself. I want to feel that, um, you know, we can be free to live life and express our creativity and to do what it is that we want to do without having the burden and the worry about all these problems that my generation didn't create. Yeah. Yeah. On point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad that we're mortgaging the future. Yeah. For the convenience of today. Yes. For the benefit of today. Mm. Right? Yeah. I want to move along to do the things that are um, positive and c- create solutions yeah. together with everyone in sync. And I don't want to be the one talking about sustainability while other people are like, <laughs> who cares? Well, why are you talking burning, about that? Or burning carbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why do you care? Yeah. But, but I, I think you both have the ability to basically create some sort of a movement, right? Mm. In realistic manner. Mm. Yeah. But Pagita, I don't want to be an, a sustainability or environmental activist. My passion is in fashion. Yeah, I yeah want that's to, not what I'm suggesting. Well, yeah. I mean, in fashion, you, <laughs> can, want, you can be an advocate for, you know, yeah. use fashion. Yeah. Not yeah. fast I, fashion. I love... I'm, I'm I not love, into fast fashion because that's not sustainable. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of things I want to... I want to do as a young person. I love art. I love design. I love aesthetics. I guess it's also part of me growing up mm. in Bali. Yeah. But whatever it is that I'm passionate about or that I want to do, I also have to do it in a smart way and taking care of the environment. So going towards sustainability. Because we want, we still want to do all these things that are creative, artistic, but we need to do it better. Yeah. Well, let's, let's pick up on this. I mean, there is a lot of stuff in the fashion industry yes. unfortunately yeah that's we, not in line with the spirit of sustainability yeah we're one of the most polluting industries in the world yeah. contributing three to five percent of the total global co2 emission correct yes correct but that's why we need to make it more green because we are the problem yeah we need to stop excluding ourselves because we are not concerned about sustainability or because we are not in that industry I get that. But how? How are you going to do it? I think slowly, slowly, people yeah, need to make, yeah. people need to make yeah. um, small incremental changes. And people need to start talking about it. People need to start stop ju- judging as well. Mm. Judging that you want to um, be more sustainable. You want to use your own 
um, bottles. You don't want, uh, sorry, plastic bottles. You want, for example, uh, reusable bottles in an event. Yeah. Would you be supportive of used fashion? Of course. Okay. Fashion To me, that's a not- low-hanging fruit, right? Mm. I mean, fast fashion, I think, is highly unsustainable. Yes. Right? Because to the extent you change models every two months, mm-hmm. styles every two months, the need to just keep on producing. Yeah. I mean, there's this hypnosis that the, the manufacturers are doing upon humanity to mm-hmm. change clothes every two months. Yeah. I mean, new styles, right? Every yeah. two months, not change clothes every two months, yeah. but you can change every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, it's not good for the planet. Yeah, fashion right? unless, unless they can actually tangibly come up with mm. technologies that yes. can actually manufacture you know, in a, in a environmentally clean manner, mm-hmm. which I'm not seeing yet. Yeah. And I believe that people are like, oh, waiting for that. They're just like yeah. handing it over to someone who they think could solve this problem and then waiting until that happens. Yeah. But then doing business as usual. Yeah. Um, fashion by definition is not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. But, that, that was like during COVID, we all thought mm-hmm. that um, fashion might change or the that it might become more sustainable. I mean, there was just this feeling that maybe yeah. things would change, but actually nothing did. Nothing. Everybody yeah. talked about it, but nothing happened. We're facing a recession, but the luxury market is going up. Yeah. You know, I was, I was reading this, this report on the demand for carbon or oil for the next few decades. It's actually flat. You know, one would have thought it's going to taper down, right? Mm. It doesn't seem to be. So that just like proves that we're doing business as usual. No. What's unusually good is automotive. Mm -hmm. That's going to come down. Demand for oil from the automotive sector is going to come down. Yeah. Because people are electrifying cars, right? Yes. Yes. But what's not coming down is petrochemical. Mm which is going to be used for fashion Polyester. Yes. And, and everything you find in a car, everything you find in a room, everything you find in a plane, everything you find in a boat ship or whatever requires petrochemical yeah. capabilities. So yeah. that's going to rise up. The most polluting part of fashion is the material production. Mm. It contributes to 35% of um, pollution in the fashion, right. in the fashion cycle. Right. And, and the third is aviation. Mm-hmm. In the next few decades, you're not going to see an electric plane no, that's, that's going to be transporting three to 400 people across yeah. the Atlantic or across the Pacific or whatever. And we're not going to stop. I mean, we stopped during the pandemic and look at it. Yeah, people are flying again like crazy. Now. Revenge, yeah. travel. People crazy. Re- revenge travel, mm. revenge shopping revenge. as well, revenge everything. So you've got a decline of demand from automotive, you've got an incline of demand from petrochemicals, you've got an incline of demand from aviation. So net net, it's flat. Mm. I we were talking about sustainability earlier, and I guess the solution is not regression, not going back to old ways or change changing things. It's about finding the best alternatives, yeah. right? I agree. I agree. But, but I think that illustration captures what's possibly going to happen. Mm. You know, as much as you want to pivot to renewables, uh, there, there are just certain things that are not going to be replaced yeah. with renewables, yeah. such as petrochemicals demand and, you know, demand for oil from the aviation industry. Realistically. Well, Indonesia is building a petrochemical industry. We're going to start producing our own plastic. Because the demand for clothes, the demand for components and whatever, that's going to be in a car, mm-hmm. it's going to be in a room, it's going to be in a plane, it's going to be in a boat, it's going to be, it's all going to require petrochemical, mm. you know, activities. The thing is, it's such a convenient material and we cannot go back from convenience. We're creatures of convenience. So that's the dilemma. How do we deal with things? 
walk to work. Reduce, <laughs> right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. We need walk to start. By. We need to start using these. Um, this reduce, reuse, recycle in yeah. in order. Reducing things. Yeah. So so important. I just I just think that in the absence of catastrophic scenarios, yeah. I don't think it's going to be easy to change habits. You know yes. that are of convenience. Mm. Definitely. So we talked about a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so much. <laughs> what else, Lakshmi, Janet? Any any big names coming up in the Ubud Writers Festival? Uh, we have. Um, well, I'm thinking of international names. We have Geraldine Brooks, who's um, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Wow. Um, actually, Australian, but living in the States. Yeah former journalist. Um, I've been a big fan of hers for a long time, so I'm really excited. She's going to be there physically? Yeah, physically, wow. yeah, yeah. I mean, we've sort of gone back into the full physical festival. Yeah, and great. Yeah, it is. I mean, we we really did think, or I was even hoping that we could still keep an element of online, you know, I felt that. Yeah, to uh, reach out to yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, like, mm. um, like we did last year, yeah. you know, that, that can still work, but we, we haven't quite gotten around to that part of it yet. Um, but, you know, beyond that, it's just, as usual, a really uh, dynamic mix of lesser-known writers but with no less um, quality of writing or words to say. So, you know, um, and trying to also think about, the full festival that's not just writers but it's also performers and artists things like that so mm. just trying to make sure we have a really dynamic package so yeah still still gathering names so good yeah good. ask me any final points well i hope that Pajoko, we will write a book <laughs> to solve all our problems that we talk about today. Well, wow, that's a little bit don't you think? But well, that's a fair request. He's going to have a lot of time on his hands. Um, if yeah. not a book, maybe a Netflix series like what um, President Obama is doing. Yeah. Have you watched any? The yeah. G Word? Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. And I think he agrees with us that, you know, the solution or to you agree with reaching him. the masses is through <laughs> pop culture, to entertainment. Yeah. yeah, I agree. We were talking about that. Yeah. How do we reach the masses? Pop, yeah. pop culture. Think about that book club. I, I will. think that's a cool idea. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to be my guest? Oh, sure. Yes. Sure. oh my God. Sure. That'd be so cute. Yeah, well. It's going to be um, so good for Indonesian writers because like Reese Witherspoon, you know, she made Where the Crawdads Sing, boom. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. we could do the same for Indonesian writers with this book club. Not globally, but at least in Indonesia. Yeah, for sure. And I need, yeah, celebrities, influencers to also help yeah. me do that. Oh. They will study on all the yeah, other that are obvious. Yeah. And there's so many stories that can be told that, you know, the, I guess it's our job to reach out to young Absolutely. people and start Whatever to, it takes to yeah. make ourselves better in storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, because in the U.S., you know, books turns into sagas movies mm. uh, blockbusters we don't mm. see that here mm. so much the last one was Laskar Pelangi yeah um, we can do even better yeah mm. right we can't just stop at that and then yeah. pat ourselves in the back there's yeah. still more work <laughs> to do <laughs> 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 I lived in Italy for four years so <laughs> I've learned to not be patient yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you're back in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, selama satu tahun menjabat jadi putri Indonesia, yeah. memang harus sabar. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. thank you, Pak Gita. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Also keep doing amazing things. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I watch you, your thank podcast thank you, religiously. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Teman-teman, itulah Laksmi dan Janet Denif dari Bali. Terima kasih banyak. Inilah Endgame.
answering your question. Which is good. It's yeah. got to be like that. Which is why we're we're not scripted. It's okay. Like, we'll come back to their tears. Yeah, uh, there's now the Ayunda, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Right? If yeah. we if we yeah. 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 wanted to do a podcast, can we ask?